Hello and thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Nicole Hashem. I'm the Environment and Energy Editor at The Conversation and I'm hosting this discussion today in collaboration with the National Library of Australia. Before we start, I just wanted to pay respect to the Ngunnawal people, the traditional custodians of the land where this recording is being made. Uh, that's the place that we call Canberra today. And I'd also like to pay my respect to the Ngunnawal elders of that land, past, present and future. So we've all been very preoccupied with COVID-19 these past few months, but we can't forget what came before it. Um, last summer's bushfires killed 34 people, destroyed thousands of homes and um, destroyed massive tracts of landscape and the plants and animals in it. Um, so, from this rupture and this devastation, what will emerge and how will nature and our communities rebuild? So to help us answer those questions, we've got three wonderful panellists with us today. The first is Petra Buergeld. She's Assistant Professor in Psychology at the University of Canberra. We have Dale Nimmo, Associate Professor of Ecology at, the Charles, at Charles Sturt University and Barbara Norman, Professor of Design, at the built, uh, Design and the Built Environment at the University of Canberra. So first, I'll just ask each of you to briefly introduce yourself and your work. I'll start with you, Dale. You're an animal ecologist and you're interested in um, how big disturbances like bushfires affect biodiversity. And yep. you're also on the panel of experts advising the federal government on bushfire recovery. Can you just tell us a bit about your work? Yeah, so uh, I did my PhD on uh, how wildlife responds to fire um, about a decade ago now. Um, and since then I've worked in different ecosystems across Australia, kind of trying to figure out what role fire plays in Australian ecosystems and how it can be managed effectively for biodiversity conservation. Okay, thanks Dale. Um, now, Petra, you study how people and communities can thrive in the face of change, adversity and chaos, um, particularly after natural disaster. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so I'm, I'm really passionate about uh, how people respond to and deal with uh, chaos and uncertainty and, and particularly with disasters. And um, my particular passion in that is very often, you know, uh, it can be traumatic for people to be in those conditions. But from my perspective, I see those conditions actually as opportunities uh, to thrive, uh, to transform uh, belief systems and um, ways of doing things uh, which are not working anymore and to come up with new and better ways of doing things. And in the last couple of years, I have had the privilege and the pleasure uh, and the honor really to work uh, with indigenous peoples in, in Australia, in Norway, and um, in, in Taiwan as well. And from those interactions, I really realized uh, the importance um, of, of uh, being in reconnection with nature and living in harmony with nature, uh, because this is uh, very much uh, um, a way of being which uh, can reduce damaging fires from occurring. Uh, but also from making ourselves stronger if uh, natural disasters occur, that we can actually respond in much better ways uh, so that we limit the impact on us. Great. Thanks, Petra. And finally, Barbara, you're an expert in sustainable planning and how to build communities that can cope with change and disaster, but also respect nature. Um, and you're also part of a cross-university response to the last bushfire season. Can you tell us a bit about your work? Sure. So my background's in urban planning, coastal planning and climate change. And a uh, long time ago, I did my PhD in uh, coasts and climate change. It wasn't so um, interesting at that point, but I found it very interesting. And it built on my uh, long-term practice and, um, and work in urban planning. Uh, so uh, my work's very much about uh, connectivity between those three. So how we can build back our cities and our townships in a more sustainable way, design with nature, work with nature, work with communities to build something even better for the future. And so connecting urban planning, land use planning with coastal planning and management with climate change adaptation particularly. Yeah. 
Thank you. Now, um, I'll just stick with you for a minute, Barbara, because uh, not only do you research community resilience to disaster, but you uh, sadly lost a family holiday home at Malakuta over the summer. Can you just tell us a bit about that? Sure. So just a bit of background there. Um, I, um, well, it's a house that we had, it's a holiday house, I should say. So, but uh, nevertheless, very dear to the four generations that enjoyed that place and mud brick house, very simple place. Like many Australian families uh, camped there for a long time, since about the age of five uh, or thereabouts. Uh, then uh, camped there, then uh, bought some land, then built a shack and then built a simple house. And, uh, and that's a story for many Australian people. And uh, so it's more the memories and the history and the long-term friendships that had uh, uh, a personal impact, uh, still does actually. Um, but also I just want to mention that um, the context of all of that. So I was on long service leave at that time and I drove from uh, King Island, which also has just been recently impacted, right along the southern coast to, uh, to Malakuta on my way back to Canberra. And I was really struck, this was before the fires, this was in November, I was really struck about uh, the impact of drought and uh, seemed like a very significant impact on the economy of the local townships at that point already before the fires. And then, got, then the fires happened and then the floods and then COVID-19. So this, I mentioned it because yes, it was a personal impact. Um, and then I lost my car in the hailstorm in Canberra. So <laughs> Personally, I felt a bit of cumulative impact, but it's the cumulative impact, I think, of these events that uh, really concerns me right now that uh, mm -hmm. just one of these events has a huge impact on you personally, but a whole series is, um, it is quite massive. And uh, you asked me what my personal experience has been. It's been a very interesting journey, even though it wasn't my home home, and I feel deep sympathy for those who have been much more directly affected. But, even from my perspective, I felt the after effects two, three, four months later, thinking, you know, there's a sadness there. But uh, uh, let's talk about the future. Mm. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm just interested, though, um, in the state of the land at the time or just before. I think you said that you'd been to that house a few months before and you were just really alarmed at, at, how nature was looking it was basically a tinderbox can you just describe the natural conditions yeah I, I, absolutely it was like that so as i said I, i've been there for decades and so i've seen it in many conditions and uh this time when i visited in uh, would have been early november um it was like a tinderbox and i talked to my long-term friends about that when i was there at that time at malakuta and the people of malakuta were talking about it too i mean the cfa there the, I think everybody was aware of the conditions and it was just going for a walk. You could see layers of um, uh, dead wood lying on the ground. It was almost stacked like a fire ready to happen right across and uh, tinder, tinder dry. So it looked like it was going to explode. And um, we always go to Malakuta in the summer and this is my big extended family. I'm one of seven and many now grandchildren and all sorts of a big, big clan, if you like. And uh, I said this year, don't go. Last year, don't go. We're not going because my mother's in the mid nineties with other things to consider. And I thought there's one road in, one road out. It's tinder dry. I think it's going to explode. It's just intuition. I guess a bit of experience behind that as well. And, and uh, so we didn't. And uh, yes, so. It was a very good decision in hindsight. So, hindsight. <laughs> um, but how, when, can you just um, describe, you know, the moment that you found out that the house was gone um, and how that unfolded? Well, I knew, um, anecdote, I knew informally, if you like, um, very close friend there for a phone call <clears> that, <throat> that uh, it had gone. But I needed to have that verified the next day, which was New Year's Day, have a friend go down and look at the site uh, in the daylight, which that happened. It was New Year's Eve. So I didn't actually share any of that with my family that night because, it, you know, I just didn't think it was appropriate. Mm. 
So until I actually had the evidence that it had happened. And so um, then as soon as I had that evidence, I'm an academic after all, I have to look at the evidence. Uh, so uh, I, um, I then uh, got the family as, as quickly as possible yeah. in the nicest way possible in those circumstances. Yeah. So that's, that's what happens. So it was a bit of a, certainly wasn't a happy news, eh? that's for sure. Now, Patrick, you were in Canberra, um, I think, watching the fires unfold on, on TV. Can you uh, tell me what you were thinking um, about what you were seeing happening? Really profound sadness, to be honest. Um, as I said, um, I'm, you know, I'm very closely connected to nature and just seeing the, the massive amount of, of nature burning. Um, and, um, and also what, what really struck me in that is that how, you know, the, the, how, how did we come to that point, right? And, you know, what was it in our action which, uh, which had created the situation? Because it's basically our actions creating what we are experiencing. Um, and at the same time, also very sad in the sense that um, as researchers, you know, we have been researching um, disasters, bushfires, other um, disasters as well. Uh, for, for decades now, and we actually have a lot of knowledge that's accumulated locally in, within Australia, but also worldwide. And so there is a lot of knowledge, which um, from our side, we haven't been particularly effective in communicating with communities and assisting and working together with communities uh, to make communities stronger and make individual people stronger as well. So for me, it was like, oh, you know, if we could, if we could work better together with communities as, as researchers, um, then maybe we could have prevented a lot of that of happening. And so for me, the thinking was then how, you know, how can we as researchers uh, create long-term relationships with communities and work together with communities where we can bring together the academic, scientific and, 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 and global knowledge with the local and practical knowledge and, and really uh, work together to strengthen the communities so that we reduce those damaging intensive bushfires from occurring, uh, but also that uh, if they occur, that, uh, that people um, individually, but also communities are much stronger to respond to them so that we limit the impact. And yeah, so I'm, I'm in particular also with- How, how might we do that? How might, how might we do that? How, how long do we have? <laughs> so there, there's many ways, and in particular, you see uh, the University of uh, Canberra. Um, we are really strong in being a civic community, and we are, so we are really uh, increasingly reaching out to communities, developing long-term relationships with communities, uh, doing participatory action research um, where we are uh, working together with communities, creating or using um, the, the, the knowledge from different disciplines, from, uh, from you know, Barbara with her planning knowledge, um, then um, the, the ecologists with their knowledge of nature, the social scientists uh, with their knowledge of how our human behavior works and how communities are working. Um, and so for us, uh, we could uh, work together there um, much more strongly. And, um, and I think also what's really important is to, um, to have a look where we could improve um, how we are working together. I think uh, human beings at the moment are not particularly strong in uh, working together. It's, it's much more a competitive system. And so how can we create uh, and, and equip people um, and also organizations to collaborate much better with each other? Mm. So that, that's a couple of things. But also uh, how can on an individual level and very practical level, how can we create um, an environment where, which is where, where we are as individual people are much more self-sustainable and, and self-sufficient? How can we uh, create houses, build houses, or at least uh, also come up with housing codes and regulations? We have so much knowledge now how we can build houses which are um, much better uh, 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 withstanding uh, fire impacts. But also, how can we, uh, you know, uh, um, create? Uh, in, speaking also of pandemics, how can we, you know, uh, create uh, uh, gardens where we can have uh, much more uh, our own vegetables, grow our own vegetables and, and 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 fruits as well. 
So, what, so, so it's what's, what's the things we can do practically on the ground? And again, you know, we have uh, a lot of knowledge in, in those areas and can bring that to communities and work together with communities. Thank you. Um, now, Dale, I'm wondering what you were thinking when you saw the, the fire disaster unfolding um, in terms of the fate of the animals on the ground, given, um, given your research focus. Yeah, um, it was definitely a, a shock. Um, being based in Albury, we were kind of covered in smoke for weeks. Um, I'm sure the situation was similar in Canberra as well. Um, so it was very real for us um, and, and fires not too far away as well. Um, so my first concern, of course, was the, the safety of my family and, and making sure that we could have clean air to breathe in our house and things like that. But of course, um, you know, I was also thinking about how wildlife would respond to these fires and uh, in many ways the, the fires themselves are fairly unprecedented so it is somewhat unpredictable to um, try to predict the outcome of an unprecedented event. Um, we know that there will have been massive amounts of mortality that many many animals will have died across the, the fire grounds and that um, it may take a long time for those ecosystems to recover um, during my PhD work, one of the, the main findings was the length of time it actually takes for species to recover following fire. So we tend to forget pretty quickly. You know, we see the, the greenery comes back and we see shrubs coming up from the ground and we think things are, are going well. Uh, but the changes continue for decades uh, and some resources will be lost for 100 years, 150 years in some of these ecosystems if we're thinking about things like hollows and big logs on the ground, that they just don't come back quickly. So it'll be a long recovery for Australia's wildlife. Um, and I just hope that, yeah, we're going to be committed along the full course of time. Yeah, yeah. Um, after the, the fires died down, I know a lot of conservation, conservation scientists were sort of gagging to get out into the field and see, see take stock of the damage. Um, were you involved in any of that? Um, and just more broadly, what was the general feeling amongst um, conservation scientists at the time? I know there was sort of a, amongst some a real feeling of despair mm. that uh, a species, threatened species that they might have been working to protect for their whole career had been decimated, for example. Yeah, um, I haven't been involved in any of the on ground field work. I've been to some of the fire grounds myself um, to have a look around and inspect the damage. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's hard not to look at a, a landscape that's undergone severe fire over a really vast area and, and um, you know, not be overcome uh, when you've spent a lot of your career trying to protect the organisms that are hopefully, you know, dwelling within those, those same landscapes. And I guess with the, the knowledge of, of the length of time it's going to take to recover and the events that preceded these fires as well, the other fires that have occurred, um, and the increasing regularity of fires in some of these systems, which are potentially pushing them into completely different ecological states where um, they'll be potentially unrecognisable. Um, and so it's understandable then that people, particularly those who have spent 40 or 50 years, uh, feel a kind of profound sense of grief that, that a lot of their work has been in vain, that a lot of the work that they've done to try to ensure that some areas are protected from other threats, um, which we know can um, drive biodiversity in a downward trajectory that, that a fire can come through and uh, potentially undo a lot of that work. But I think that in another way, that's, it's, that's also um, the shock of the moment. Um, and it, it is too early in, in many ways to conclude that everything in the fire grounds is lost just because it can appear that way. Um, our Australian wildlife is resilient to fire. Um, the scale of these fires makes it particularly challenging, but I'd never counted it. Mm. Um, and to my knowledge, we don't know of any extinctions that we could draw um, down to being due to these fires so far. That's not to say that they won't occur, but um, yeah, there's still a lot of uncertainty about how it'll play out and, and the surveys are ongoing, trying to get a grip of, you know, what populations have survived, um, what the level of survivorship within those populations is and those types of things. Mm. Um, can you tell me about the recovery work? So you've been helping drive that um, in your role on the expert panel. Um, yep. 
where do you start? Does it feel overwhelming you, you know, a few days after or a week after the fires and you've got, you know, millions of hectares of burnt land? Mm. How do you decide what to do? Um, well, the first thing is to try to get a good understanding of the extent of the damage. And so that's about um, generalising across the different states because we don't have a national approach to fire mapping, for example. When, and uh, species obviously occur across all the borders they don't pay attention to whether it's New South Wales or Victoria. Um, and so it was about kind of getting a national um, perspective on how those species have been impacted. And the, and the first thing we do there is look at where do these species occur using different types of models that we can create or expert knowledge and how much of that area burnt. And, and, and the next step is at what severity did it burn? So that can help us prioritise which species we think might be under the most threat of extinction. Um, and so that was kind of the first step. And one of the things that became apparent pretty quickly was that some, we have lots of narrowly distributed species in Australia in, in those fire grounds. Um, you know, reptiles that are only known from a handful of sites, for example, or invertebrates that are only known from one site. And they're, it's all the only place they're known from in all of the world. So when you think about those species, they're the ones that, that to me, demand the most urgent kind of attention and, and interventions. Um, and so, and then there are other species that might be um, more broadly distributed, just had by chance a really large proportion of their habitat burned. Uh, and we also consider really carefully their trajectory prior to the fire. You know, are these species, were they secure before the fire? Were they widespread or were they on a downward trajectory? Were they already regarded as threatened with extinction? Uh, and if that's the case, again, that, that means that there's going to have to be some urgent interventions to try to prevent these species from being pushed closer and closer to extinction. Mm. So that's the kind of assessment that you can do on the desktop, but the activities that you'll, that, that are kind of undertaken on the ground, which are led uh, by state agencies, um, primarily and, and different organisations, um, conservation organisations, NGOs. Um, those activities include things like trying to release the other pressures, which will be acting on these species and might interact with fire to further imperil them. So things like um, feral cats and foxes, which are common in many of our landscapes, trying to make sure that we can have an impact on their numbers, uh, or in some instances, put up fences to exclude them from sensitive populations. And that's what happened on, uh, on Kangaroo Island, which experienced particularly severe fire. Um, and they put up a conservation fence to protect uh, the Kangaroo Island Dunnart, which is a a little critter that's only found on that island and, and there was real concern about its its plight and its ability to persist but they were able to do quick actions to um, exclude um, feral cats in that instance to increase the chances of it surviving and those types of actions uh, take place across the extent of the fire grounds to different degrees but um, there's also only so much you can do those, those actions are quite expensive. Mm. Um. Now, Barbara, you were involved in pulling together a sort of rapid response uh, team of experts in the, the days and weeks after the fires to help with community recovery. Um, can you tell me what that involved um, and what, what work you've done so far? Mm. There are a couple of phases. Um, in the immediate aftermath, um, I convened a meeting of uh, uh, experts across in the, the Australian capital region, if you like, uh, and uh, involved uh, academics, uh, people from local government, people from agencies. So we hosted that meeting. That was the first thing we did at the University of Canberra. And the National Bushfire Agency attended that. And they days at that point, so very, very early on. And then that led to um, a number of projects happening across the university. And also that initiative led to a, um, a, a, a cross-campus bushfire response group uh, chaired now by our Deputy Vice-Chancellor and Petra was part of that. So there are some different elements. Uh, my personal work um, and with my colleagues has been uh, trying to uh, revisit a study that we did in 2013, Southeast Coastal Adaptation Project funded by the National Climate Change Adaptation Research Facility. Uh, it was particularly looking at coastal urban futures in the context of climate change. So highly relevant to this, what's been happening since. Uh, that work in 2013 uh, uh, 
laid out a series of projections informed by the IPCC Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change Science and a number of focus groups uh, with uh, local communities and also a partnership with the School of Arts at ANU. So it was a very collaborative piece of work and it laid out possible scenarios for 2030. Um, and unfortunately, and, and but accurately, it predicted exactly what happened in this last summer. Uh, wasn't the only prediction we had because of course there's the impacts of coastal inundation and coastal storms and and uh, a number of impacts on uh, predicted for coasts. So uh, by by our climate change science. So um, that was almost like it's almost like a baseline report, if you like, because it covered the councils from Wollongong to Lakes Entrance, precisely those coastal councils affected by fire uh, over the 2019-20. And it had, uh, I, the reason I, I think it had strength was it had um, University of Canberra, we led it uh, with ANU, with the University of Wollongong, so three big universities in the region, and with those councils as well. So, and CFA and a number of other very important players too. Um, I'm just so, interested. So just bringing um, it to today. On to yeah. stop. Sorry, go on, Nicole. Oh, uh, just on that, you've obviously, You've been advising authorities and creating, you know, producing reports for a long time now um, on how communities can adapt to climate change. Um, I'm just wondering whether that advice has been heeded and is that a frustration if it's not? <laughs> well, I think anyone who's been in this game is extremely frustrated over the last maybe past five, six years. Um, so, um, 2013 was almost like a high watermark for, uh, for people involved in uh, uh, coast climate change, bushfire, CRC, a whole lot of terrific work happening in the country and leading internationally, actually. Mm -hmm. And then uh, almost since then, we've had a kind of um, uh, systematic dismantling of those initiatives. And I, I could go on for quite a long time, but I won't. But, you know, I think uh, those uh, are well documented, the defunding of climate research in CSIRO, the removal of the National Climate Council, um, the removal of very useful programs like the Local Adaptation Pathways Program uh, that was uh, funded uh, um, by the then government. I think that was Penny Wong, actually, the minister at the time. And, uh, and uh, so removal of those funding opportunities for local councils, which will bring me to, back to answering fully your question in that since then, since uh, the summer and since our uh, first meeting, I've worked quite closely with some of the local councils. I've been very much in touch with Yorubadala Council, which had uh, Mogo and Maria and those areas that were very much affected. And uh, together in the spirit of uh, best practice, co-design, collaboration, we have developed a brief for a local adaptation strategy for that area to, that we, Wollongong, ANU, UC, again, work together with Yorubadala and the neighbouring councils to do something a bit like we did in 2013, but hopefully even better. Thing is, now, today, I understand no, that sorry, the thing is that there's no funding source for that now because of the mm. stripping away of all those other initiatives that were there. So. So we've got some good bottom-up activity starting to work together, uh, very difficult circumstances, uh, very positive uh, contributions and collaborations, but there's nothing to hang our hat on. There's nothing to... So I have been in touch with the National Bushfire Agency to see if there would be some possibility there, and I'm still waiting for a response to that. So what are the key actions that need to happen? Um, well, certainly, certainly uh, when the Bushfire Agency came to that first meeting, the National Bushfire um, Recovery Agency, I gave them three pieces of advice. Uh, one was um, to uh, uh, join the dots, so take an integrated approach. Um, the second one was about um, building back better. So let's take this opportunity to have more sustainable futures for everybody. And when I say that, I don't just mean physical buildings and infrastructure. Uh, people need jobs, people need futures in every sense of that word. And uh, no white elephants. Not that I've got anything against elephants, it's a phrase that, uh, that um, in fact, I love elephants, but I, it's just a, a phrase that, um, that um, I can see a real problem uh, looming. 
So the National Bushfire Agency has $2 billion to spend. And I'm not just talking about them, I'm talking about all the other big sort of collection of uh, fund uh, groups. And they all have their own budget cycles and when, uh, nationally they have their political cycles and elections. So it's all gotta be spent really quickly, if you like. So we've got this really strange scenario happening right now. We've got those who need immediate urgent assistance, seemingly some still living in tents. So that doesn't seem to be working very well. But the area that I'm most interested in, or I guess my expertise is in, I'm not an expert in the emergency area, is, the, is more the longer term strategic planning about how can we take this as an opportunity to work with communities, bringing the evidence base from universities, bringing the local knowledge from communities, and, and really deeply think about, well, if, uh, if we could do anything in the world, what kind of community would we like to have here in the future? And really do some of that uh, scenario planning. Now, this takes time. I guess that's my key message. And I can see on the one hand, all this money is going to be out the door in the next 18 months before the next election to meet those budget commitments nationally. And on the other hand, the community needs a hell of a lot more time than 18 months to be able to work through these issues, even emotionally. Uh, you know, uh, building back in a really emotionally distressed state it does not always end up with what you actually want. You, it's a long-term process of healing, uh, mental health, physical health, community coming together, uh, uh, understandings developing, um, which is a long way from what can happen in the emergency area, which is, you know, why did Bob down the road get something and I didn't, and you know, all the scrapping that can go on because people are just stressed. So um, I think uh, it's a great opportunity for the future. And uh, if we all work together, we could do something special. So thank you, Barbara. Um, now, Petra, you researched the, the sort of psychological and environmental factors that influence how we prepare for natural disaster and how we respond. Um, how good are we at, at doing that historically? Um, and uh, like, uh, for example, I understand there are a lot of psychological barriers to preparing for a disaster that people feel like it's not gonna happen to them. Yeah, so historically, we haven't been doing too well. <laughs> uh, historically, we haven't been learning from the past per stop. And, um, and there's a couple of reasons for why we haven't been learning from the past. Uh, once, uh, one reason is really that um, our society, our culture is not very good with, um, with uh, mistakes, learning from mistakes. Because if you look at the past, we will see that we made many mistakes. Um, so learning, uh, so rather than seeing uh, mistakes as failure, if we could turn it around and actually see mistakes um, we made in the past as huge learning and growth op opportunities and, and, and really as a feedback loop from what is not working and also as a clue for what could work better, then we could make really headways. And also we have... To what, what we, um, sorry, can you give us an example of, or a couple of examples of some past mistakes that we should have learned from? Yeah, for example, what, what uh, Barbara alluded to that, you know, we, we are thinking in those short term uh, cycles uh, rather than actually in, in long term cycles. And so we, we very often, um, for example, with, uh, with after uh, doing a response, we have projects for a couple of years or maybe just for a couple of months and we bringing in a lot of people which start from scratch uh, with no expertise in the area. Um, and then they are building up the expertise and then the project stops and those people go away. And then when the next uh, disaster happens or an extreme event happens, we basically start from zero again, rather than if we would work long-term together, we would build up the expertise rather than always starting from scratch again. Um, and, mm -hmm. and that that's huge that we are making right there. Um, also that we are not really working together with communities. We have in the past uh, always communi communicated top down um, and, and imposing on communities, telling communities what to do, um, rather than actually looking uh, what, what's the resources in the community and how can we facilitate the community from the bottom up, developing using their unique strength and their unique environment and, and, and resources how could we uh, facilitate them 
building up on that to become stronger. So that's mm -hmm. a couple of things um, which, which has been working. Also, what, um, what we have not been considering, we have a very interesting relationship in the Western, uh, Western world to nature. Um, we are seeing ourselves as separate from nature. And this is then leading to actions of trying to control or manipulate or manage nature, which then feeds actually into uh, creating those disasters um, as well. So if you could turn that around and actually learn from and, and, and really stop and, and reflect and say, hey, hold on, that's not working. How can we uh, perceive our relationship with nature in a different way? And um, to, to actually realize, hold on, we are um, nature. We are connected intimately with nature. And if we take care of nature and of country, uh, then we can stop the occurring uh, of those disasters in the first place. So um, just on that picture, um, obviously uh, the way we manage land today is very different to how Indigenous people managed mm -hmm. it uh, with fire and cultural burning before white settlement. Um, and they were quite effective at reducing the incidence of large fires and maintaining biodiversity. Um, what do you think needs to happen there? I know this is an issue that the Bushfire Royal Commission is looking at. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent do you think we need to draw on that sort of ancient fire practice in mainstream fire management today? Oh, we would be very wise if we would actually listen <laughs> and value the, the knowledge which Indigenous cultures have been, and in particular Australian Indigenous peoples have been building up for what we know over um, about 120,000 years. That's a very long time. And um, during those times, uh, a lot of changes in the climate happen. So the very uh, fact that indigenous peoples have been uh, surviving for such a long time is that they had close relationships with nature and very intimate and extensive and very sophisticated knowledge of nature. And we got, only have to go to a post, um, Process Pascal's dark emo that we, to know actually how sophisticated this, this knowledge is. Now, if we can draw up in this knowledge and, and really work together with and learn from indigenous peoples and, and enable indigenous peoples to do what they are doing best, looking after country and working together with country, um, then we would have a totally different situation. So it's, it's really, we would, and, and, and this is increasingly happening now, um, that, that uh, we are working together with indigenous peoples and looking into um, and, and enabling them to do the cultural learning. Um, and that would then reduce uh, the, the intensity of fire. Because fire, as, as, as Dale said, uh, Australia has evolved with fire. So there's a lot of nature which actually requires fire, but it's a very different type of fire. It is uh, a mature fire, which is very um, selective in what it is burning. It's actually uh, a facilitating nature to renew. Now, what we are having, because we are not looking after nature, we are having this intensive, tremendously intensive and widespread fires, and that's the damaging element. So if we would, um, would listen to and work together with indigenous peoples, uh, we could really turn the tide there. Great. Um, Dale, uh, as Petra just said, um, you know, Australia is a, a fire landscape. Um, the plants and animals have over the, over the centuries and millions of years evolved to adapt. Um, how, what are some of the ways that they have done that? Um, and, and how do some of these uh, plants, or in your case, animals, um, survive these terrible infernos? And, and given that they're coming more frequently now and they're more severe, um, mm. I, I think that's sort of outpacing the ability of of these species to adapt, is that right? Yeah, so um, there's been a lot of work done over the years about plant responses to fire and um, how, how there's various mechanisms of plants can re-sprout um, and survive a fire and live to fight another day. Um, and a lot of uh, Australian plant species have, the, have those adaptations and, and then um, others don't, which, which puts them at risk of um, being removed from a system if fire starts to become more frequent in that system. 
Um, but we're starting to learn a little bit more about the, the wildlife responses as well and their ability to cue in and detect fires from, from a long distance away and, and um, put into motion some um, behaviours that will help them survive fire. And so there was a, an interesting study um, that was done, I think it was only last year, where some people were in a zoo uh, in the United States and they had some stumpy tailed lizards uh, in their, near their staff room where they were cooking up their lunch and they burnt some pastry or something. And all of a sudden the, the stumpy tails started going berserk and racing up and down and trying to escape their tanks. And they quickly rushed down to another part of the building um, which wasn't affected by the smoke from the burnt food. And they found that all the stumpy tails in that area were calm as they should be that time of day, just kind of laying under a, a bit of um, leaf litter or whatever it might be. Um, and so they started to look into it and, and it turns out that there's actually quite a few responses like that in, in Australian wildlife species where a species can detect, um, in that instance, it would have been through olfaction, through their sense of smell, um, detecting a fire that's occurring and that creating a behavioural response that would minimise the effects of, of being killed. So it might be for a stumpy tail, you know, get the hell out of there, find a, a crevice or a burrow that you can duck into while the fire passes. Um, there are other species uh, where we know that um, the cues of fire can cause them to go into torpor, so to actually suppress their met metabolic rate. And um, that prevents them from needing to go out and forage after a fire, which is a particularly um, bad time to be getting out and about, particular, particularly if you're a little critter like a little marsupial um, or a little lizard or something like that, where you have birds of prey coming in and potentially um, you know, dive bombing into the, into the fire ground because they can see the prey more easily and the prey is more exposed. And now we have feral cats coming in from a, from a distance. There was a, a study that showed feral cats um, can detect a fire from over 10 kilometres away and move directly to the fire scar's edge, <coughs> hunt along the edge and mm. then in a few weeks go back home. So they know what they're doing. They know how to cue into fires just like the uh, potential prey species do. Mm. Um, but it, but it is something we're only just learning about these behavioural responses of wildlife, which um, might explain why sometimes, in my experience, there is generally a, a higher level of survival, even in, in areas that are severely burnt than you might expect, but it is very species specific. So mm -hmm. species that live in, in treetops, for example, suffer really high rates of mortality and don't necessarily have any uh, capacity to survive a really severe fire, whereas species that are able to um, use rocks and, and uh, burrows and things like that generally are able to fire as long as they have some warning. Mm -hmm. um, Petra spoke about the sort of fracture in their relationship between humans and nature um, leading or contributing to some of these disasters. Um, there was a huge outpouring of, of grief after the fires um, for a lot of reasons, but the loss of nature and the impact on the billions of animals was mm. one of them. Um, do you, how might we address this sort of split, I suppose, between the, in the connection between humans and nature? Mm. And um, what did it show you seeing how much people cared um, after the fires? How can we sort of build on mm. that? Yeah. So yeah, I'd, I'd echo some of what Petra said um, about learning from, um, you know, a, a culture that's been living in this landscape for tens of thousands of years and having fire very much um, as an important component of that culture. Um, so I think that, I actually think that the, the population of Australia in general is coming around to this, this idea that maybe a colonial kind of approach to land use in, in Australia isn't appropriate and that we have a lot to learn. And I really do feel from just my conversations with people that aren't in science, that there's this, this growing recognition, hey, we need to start listening. Um, Indigenous people have a lot to teach us about how to um, live, in this, live in this country. And, and one of those things I think is the nuance um, of different approaches to landscape management in different types of ecosystems, rather than trying to apply a really broad brush across all these different ecosystems. And a prime example of that is the idea that we can apply a a target of 5% burning, for example, across all, all ecosystems it, as a broad brush hazard reduction approach rather than thinking carefully about what is, what is the place of fire in this ecosystem, how much is enough, how much is too much, when should it come, uh, what time of year and those types of things. Um, 
Sorry, Nicole, <laughs> can you remind me of the question? Oh, <laughs> that's all right. Um, there was a huge outpouring of grief um, mm. in terms of the animal, yeah, horse yeah. animals. Um, so how might we, we build on that um, to sort of forge mm. these new connections between humans and nature? Yeah. Yeah, and so I think that that part of that that reconnecting is trying to get people in Australia, first of all, to be more aware of the the unique biodiversity and wildlife that we have. That you know, people in Victoria wouldn't realise that within a few hours' drive, we've got um, amazing little pygmy possums and stuff, you know, running around in in Mallee forests. Um, so part of it is awareness, and and I think a part of it is um, kind of pride in, in the, um, or, you know, I think pride's the wrong word, um, a bit more ownership of, of the, the things that we have, that um, these ecosystems that are so rich um, have been maintained for, for thousands of years um, that we have inherited. And we should take it personally when they're, when they're degraded and, and when they're suffering and um, under our watch, uh, we're losing species. I, I think that people don't take it personally enough that, that we're passing on a, a depleted ecosystems to our children. Mm, yeah, that's right. I, I like to contribute there um, in, in, in a couple of ways. So first of all, you know, really working together with indigenous peoples and in, in different localities. And, uh, and that might be a challenge So we will need to learn how to interact um, in, in culturally appropriate ways with indigenous peoples um, and in respectful ways, uh, but also in, in our own backyards and, you know, in, in, in our families. I mean, like Australia is in, in this really great position that we, many people have houses with gardens. So really to, you know, go and use your gardens to, um, to grow your own food, your own vegetables, your own, um, your own fruit. And uh, also in, in terms of children, you know, to get children more out into nature uh, to, uh, you know, in, in Germany, so actually I'm originally from Germany, so we, we have the school garden movement, you know, where uh, children at school learn about how to grow their own food. In Australia, you, you know, uh, children actually can do that. Um, they can grow their own foods in their own backyards, and that will reconnect children, but also uh, adults um, with, with nature and the appreciation from nature and, and uh, also, you know, getting the connection, hold on, actually food does not grow in supermarkets, it actually grows in nature. And if we are destroying nature, we are really destroying our, our, our foundation of survival and thriving. And also, I think what we would then recognize in, in being out more in nature and, and interacting with nature, um, the, how, you know, how important nature is for our health and well-being in many different ways. It's very therapeutic. Um, you know, uh, we are, there's now a, a growing body of uh, research as well, which very much shows how important um, nature interactions are for the social development and, and for the physical and motor sensitive um, development of children. Um, but also how therapeutic it is to interact with uh, um, a nature in terms of reducing our stress levels. Um, how, you know, how uh, more nutritious and healthy home-grown food is, how much exercise it gives us to grow our own food. So actually all of this has multiple benefits. So if we can, you know, start there, I think then we uh, would make a, a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, all right, look, I think we should probably go to questions now. Um, we've thrown this discussion open to questions that have come in from social media and elsewhere. Um, the first one I think probably um, would apply to all of you. Uh, should we be scared about what is to come in future? And do you think fear or hope is a better motivator for change? Barbara, I'll start with you. Well, definitely hope. Um... Fear is not a good place for anyone to be in, in, in any circumstance. Uh, so um, definitely one of hope. Uh, and I think there's much to be hopeful for. Um, so coming from my own uh, experience and background that uh, this is an opportunity for communities to build back better, as I said before, that's not a phrase of mine, that's actually a phrase from the United Nations Disaster Agency. And, and um, 
but I think uh, sometimes we've heard the phrase snap back. I, I really don't like that. Uh, I've heard uh, uh, even, but bounce back, I don't particularly like that either. But I do like the kind of phrase of bouncing forward. And uh, so it's to take this opportunity to, to make that uh, transition for local communities, but with local communities. The point I made before is that they need to be provided with the tools and the funds uh, over an appropriate time frame for, that will enable those communities to determine their own futures. I do think this is a really interesting opportunity to focus much more on regional towns and country towns than we have in the past. Uh, a lot of our work is on our big global cities. Clearly, we need to be planning them better every day. There's no argument from me there. But I do think that uh, there's a, uh, this is an opportunity for governments of all levels to uh, work with local communities and say, look, clearly things aren't working well you know, from many perspectives. And uh, this particular event, the fire event, it's almost been like a tipping point. And then with COVID, even more so. And so let's, let's have a program. You know, if you're asking me about hope, let's have a national program that, that uh, is nuanced to, to local conditions, as Dale said, not a, not a program that says this has to happen everywhere, but provides that, that framework, if you like, that uh, enables communities to reach out and say, look, we've got a really good idea about renewable energy, or we've got a really good idea about smart infrastructure for our local community, about building uh, much more resilience, or about green growth, green jobs, about uh, different employment opportunities. Well, we haven't ever mentioned the sort of partnerships that you could have between uh, regional universities and, um, and we obviously, two of us come from one, the University of Canberra, but regional universities with regional communities and local communities working together. We need innovative funding uh, programs to enable communities to connect those dots. A lot of it is about connectivity, but it's also about a much more sustainable future. So I do think there's hope. It's the only way to move forward, if you like. And, uh, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's just, I think it's a special opportunity for this country to uh, better connect with the indigenous people of Australia, which we've just talked about, much better connection. You know, um, the National Library, this whole thing is about dreaming, I think, isn't it, at the moment? And uh, of course, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the classic person was uh, Martin Luther King, who said, I have a dream. Well. It's pretty appropriate what's been happening recently, isn't it? And, uh, I, and I, but I think we should be dreaming about this country. What is our dream for the future? There are far too many conversations about negativity, fear, all those things. So let's have a hopeful conversation and uh, hopefully this is part of it. Thanks, Barbara. And um, Petra, do you think we should be scared about what's to come under, you know, obviously climate change is making the bushfire regime worse, um, or do you think that hope is a better motivator for change? Well, I, I would say uh, uh, being afraid is actually a good thing because it kind of chokes people a little bit out of the ordinary. And, and um, so it's, it's a matter of being afraid effectively. Because if you're afraid too much, then you're going into doing nothing and are overwhelmed. But if you are uh, afraid um, a bit and can actually use being afraid as an, an opening space for seeing what's really going on, and I think that's uh, what I'm sensing uh, from conversations and from following um, the media as well, to, to use it, as, as Barbara said, as an opportunity to, to stop and reflect and to look what's going on here. Um, you know, what's actually important in our lives? Uh, what could be the cause of what's happening here and how could we move forward? But not in a hopeful way, because hopeful is kind of, you know, something which is outside of our, our, um, our, our reach. And, and, uh, but to take agency, to take ownership and to say, hold on, you know, each individual per person can actually do something here. And what can I do in my life to contribute to turning the tide here? And I think mm -hmm. to, to, to become much more open to new ways of seeing and doing things and knowing things. And that's where, you know, uh, working with indigenous peoples comes in, but also to look in, into, you know, what, what are actually different cultures are doing? Um, because there's a lot of knowledge, you know, globally, which we can draw up and, and 
there's lots of technology we can use now to um, you know to to make ourselves stronger as well and how can you also psychologically become stronger how can we de develop our, our capacities um, so it's it's not um, you know some something hopeful but actually something actively doing something about it so I think huge opportunity and to Barbara said, and also to take the long-term approach, very, very important, and to build up them. Thanks, Petra. And Dave, what about you? Should we be scared of the future or feel hopeful? Yeah, I think it's um, a really important distinction is between, you know, worrying about the future and what it could present and panicking, um, because panicking is never uh, useful, but, but it is legitimate to be worried and concerned. Um, hope also has a role. So we need to imagine the future that we want and, and that's that's we how we hope the future will be uh, and then we need to use our you know anxiety about not reaching that future to motivate our behavior towards to propel us towards that future and also um, you know use evidence to realistically look at what alternative futures mm -hmm. would look like if we don't um, get going and start doing things that will propel us towards a future that we do want mm -hmm. um, there's another question question here about uh you know if these natural disasters occur more, more often and more severely as scientists have predicted that they will um how does this affect our ability to recover mentally uh physically and and environmentally um i might ask you on mental recovery is it going to get harder as these disasters become more frequent yeah, it's 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 basically a laying up and you know, so it's one thing happened as we, we had you know, I mean like we have this experience here in Australia, the first of the trout, then the bushfires, and you know, then we kind of started craving a little bit after the, the bushfires and then the hell set in. Um and and that came on top of it and now the pandemic. So each time um it's you know, and the longer it, so it's built as as Barbara said, it builds up on each other. And then the longer it takes, uh, the more exhausting it becomes. And um, when we're speaking about recovery um, under, you know, normal circumstances, a recovery can take, you know, as we know now from research, um, more than 10 years. Mm -hmm. So it is a long-term process anyway, right? But if you then have the next, um, you know, uh, disaster happening within that time, then we basically are constantly being in responding recovery and then it makes it challenging to rebuild out of it. Um, so so it's, it, it's very concerning and, and you know, if, uh, given all the scientific evidence now that um, disasters are becoming um, more frequent and more uh, severe as well, that, that's a real concern. So, it's, so this is, I think, why this is such a huge, huge opportunity for us to stop now and to mm -hmm. say, hey, we're going into this really dangerous uh, downward spiral. Um, how can we how can we put, stop this downward spiral and actually bring it up into an upward spiral and build up in a future which which prevents us going down? Yeah, and Barbara, what about the physical recovery? And uh, by that, for you, I mean, you know, are we always going to be able to build back? Um, you know, do we have to perhaps accept that some uh, parts of Australia are not going to be habitable um, yeah. under climate right. change and, and more frequent disasters? Mm. Well, that's very much, a, that's always a controversial area to be talking about, whether we're talking about rebuilding or retreat, if you like. Um, it will definitely be a mix in the future. Uh, Having said that, I think there's a much more mature conversation about this now in Australia. I think that's one of the good things that's happened. Uh, uh, when I used to talk about this in the, around the year 2000, uh, I'd just about be run out of the, the town. Um, but then um, uh, now when I talk about it, uh, even on the, some of the shock jock radios, uh, I, I find that uh, people want to engage in that conversation very quickly and much more readily about, well, what are the options? What is the evidence? Can you help us and work with us to work out where we can build, where we cannot build, where it's high risk? Um, and so I do think that as the science is coming through, 
you know, forget about the sort of more hysterical front pages we see sometimes. I'm talking about real communities having real conversations about real situations. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it is a much more informed discussion that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, that doesn't mean it's not highly sensitive. If you're talking about someone's place, obviously a sense of deep sense of belonging, it's uh, incredibly sensitive. Mm -hmm. But you need to provide options, talk about options. Uh, Again, we're coming back to hope. So building on the cliff face of a coastal eroding area is not a sensible thing to be doing now or in the future. Uh, but uh, sitting down with those people and talking about, well, what could we do here? And um, it might take five years, it might take 10. It may be a situation where those people live in a, say, a bushfire prone area until they uh, uh, till they come to the end of their natural term of their life and they hand that then back to the state forest. I mean, there's a lot of options that have actually happened. Mm -hmm. In this country, we've actually done a lot of this already and we forget. Uh, we moved a lot of townships when we built the Snowy Mountains Hydro. We've moved townships uh, from, from the coast uh, where we've had old colonial subdivisions from the British coming out in the late 1800s and inappropriately subdividing sand dunes basically and we've had to buy it all back. We bought back the whole face of Mount Dandenong in the 70s. So we actually have done a lot of this work in the past. We need to uh, build on that. Mm. So anyway. Thank you Barbara. Um, and Dale, just in terms of um, environmental recovery and, and nature recovery, fire, the fire, severe bushfires are becoming more frequent um, do we need to accept that we are going to lose some species, for example, or that um, some ecosystems are going to be changed and they will never return to what they were? Yeah, um, I don't think there's any need to accept uh, extinction, um, but we will um, definitely see a lot of changes. So in, in fire ecology, one of the central concepts is the idea of the fire regime. So we don't just think about a single fire event, um, but rather the sequence of fires that have occurred over time and when they occurred and their intensity and things like that, because we know that that, that sequence of fires and their timing is what really shapes the nature of the ecosystem, including the, the structure of the ecosystem. So. If you could imagine a forest recovering from a, from a severe bushfire and another fire occurs 30 years later, then any development of those resources that I was talking about earlier, things like uh, hollows, for example, for wildlife, then they're delayed further. Um, you, you might not see them again come online for a much longer period of time. Um, but what becomes really concerning is when fire frequency changes such that the kind of dominant species in the ecosystem change because they can't actually so they reach maturity to set seed before the next fire comes about. And, and we are seeing some of that um, in Australia at the moment. Um, alpine ash is, is one example. It takes about 20 years to uh, get old enough to set seed. It needs to set seed. It can't re sprout like some other species can. Um, and so it needs at least 20 years. Uh, and it's some of the, these ecosystems have had three fires within 20 years. Some of them had three severe fires within 20 years. So as the young individuals are growing up, hopefully becoming the next generation of mature individuals of that alpine ash ecosystem, um, they're burnt and then there's no capacity for recovery. Uh, and so instead of an alpine ash ecosystem, you have you know, a scrubland that um, develops instead. And, and that, that shrubland might be composed of species that are more fire prone as well. And so it creates a, a positive feedback. And in a way, that's just um, what ecosystems do. When, when a change in fire severity occurs or fire frequency, then it makes sense that the species assemblages in that area should adapt and that, that, that those that are more fire adapted should um, become dominant. But it's just really disconcerting for people that are used to knowing these vast areas as one type of ecosystem to all of a sudden see them transform before their eyes into a different type of ecosystem. Mm. And also, you know, when you lose those, those dominant species and you have an ecosystem change like that, you obviously lose all the fauna that's associated with them as well. Yeah. Um, so in, in ecology, we were always thinking about that, that cumulative stress and not just of, of fire, but also, of, you know, the, the droughts that preceded the fires, um, the loss of habitat preceded the fires and all those types of things as well. 
Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Dale. Um, so, look, I think um, it would be nice to end on a hopeful note. And I think, as Barbara said, the theme of this event series is Australian Dreams. We've covered this a little bit, but I just wanted to know for each of you, just briefly, if we, you know, if we look back at, at this point in history, um, what, what do you hope that Australia has learnt from the last bushfire season? I'll start with you, Petra. I think uh, it would be very useful um, to, uh, that, 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 to, to realise that we created it, but also that's very powerful because we can also create a different future. So that we're realising the power we have actually to create um, us thriving with fire, mm. to coexist and live in harmony with, with the natural environment. Uh, we become open to new ways of seeing the world and, and which then would give rise to new actions as well um, and to learn in, in this particular respect from indigenous cultures and um, uh, to, to really, really reconnect with nature and to live in harmony with nature. I think if we, um, if, if we can get that right, then we would make a big, big progress here. Yeah. Also to, um, as we said before, to uh, to learn to think long term and also to have the big picture and to see every element of the of, of um, what we've been just talking about of, of the, at the human level and at the natural level as being interconnected and so that the more we are taking care of nature the more we are actually taking care of ourselves. Thanks Petra. And um, Barbara just briefly what about you? I think that we need to provide um, the tools and the resources and invest much more in local communities to enable them to have these conversations and uh, to enable them to have these conversations to do their own visioning, talk about their own future and have platforms where they can connect with their regional institutions, regional TAFEs, regional universities and to build the skills as well. We haven't talked much about local economy and that's a critical part of this, you know. Uh, good outcomes that could come from this need to have good economic outcomes. People will be able to have more sustainable economic futures, environmental futures and social, social futures. All of that is required, but they need to be given the tools. So it's, I think one of the big lessons from my perspective and I, am sort of hopeful that maybe that is not the right way but I'm, I wish if you like is that we also recognize much more the role of public service and public good out of all of this that uh, that it has a really important role in helping communities um, to provide for their own futures and that there's all very much about partnerships I think there'd be far too much stripping back at the margin all over the place and uh, we need that's this is all part of building much more resilience for those communities in the future thanks barbara and uh what, what do you hope um the other lessons that australia learns from the last fire season yeah um, i guess one thing i hope is that um the fires have jolted some people into accepting the reality of, of climate change and Maybe there are fewer skeptics now than there were prior to the fire season, I hope. Um, and so that we can get some, some action on climate change, uh, both in Australia and you know, further action across the globe because it is gonna take a global effort to get in control of this uh, situation. Um, in terms of you know, what I hope, um, I think reiterating what others have said as well, you know, I hope that we can more, with more humility kind of learn from um, other cultures um, and particularly indigenous Australians about how we can live uh, in a better way in this land, uh, more in line with um, the ecosystems that are here uh, so that we can potentially prevent these things from occurring so often. Absolutely, thank you. Look, I think that's a really good place to end the conversation. Um, Thank you so much to all of you. It's been really fascinating. And thank you to everyone who's tuned in today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for the opportunity.